Leading to here. Extraordinary stories from everyday leaders. Welcome to Leading to Here. This is a podcast series where we'll spend a little time with some of the amazing people we have met and work with at Thinking Focus over the last seven years as we help individuals, teams and businesses get out of their own way. My name's Richard and with me is Ricky. Hi everybody. Our guest today is Michael Smith. Michael is one of the most inspirational leaders we've met in that time, someone who's gone from being a young lad from the northeast of the UK to leading teams right across Europe and now finds himself living and working in California as Chief Commercial Officer of Senendo. Michael, welcome. Hey Rich, Uh, thanks for for having me, great to be here. Ah, It's great to have you along. Michael, just tell us a little about your current role and the company you work for, Senendo. Thanks, Rich. So yeah, I'm so I'm the Chief Commercial Officer at uh, at Sinendo. We are a publicly traded uh, med tech company um, here in the US, and I've been here for about two years now. I'm responsible for all of our uh, commercial, customer, go to market efforts. Um, and when I when I joined the company, we were still a private company. Um, and uh, actually, my, my first day with the company was the the beginning of the S1 process, which is the effectively the regulatory right. process uh, that, that, that takes the company public. It's a call it a six month process. So, yeah. uh, so got to get that education and, uh, and, and it resulted in us going public at the end of, of, of 21, which was a, a great experience. So, um, so, yeah, that's uh, that's kind of it. Wow. So day one was uh, was an interesting day there. Yeah, it was an education. <laughs> just just take us back a little bit. What Whereabouts in the northeast are you from? What was family like? What was school like? Paint a picture for us. Yeah, so I, I grew up uh, about 10 miles north of Newcastle. Um, I guess a relatively small town called Cramlington. It was a new town that was built in the, mostly in the, in the 70s. It was uh, it was previously a, a, a number of small uh, pit villages, which right. over the years had come together through development and uh, building of houses. And uh, I, I guess now it's a, it's a it's a much larger town. And hmm. uh, but but I, I I was there until I was uh, nineteen, right. till I went to university. Um, I, you know, I uh, had a close group of friends there. Uh, went to the Went to the local high school, uh, played a lot of football, and um, y- you know, I I I I'd say that as I was growing up, the 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 thing that I wanted to do, the thing that I wanted to emulate from a career mm-hmm. standpoint was um, was was my dad. My dad was in the police. You know, he he'd oh, okay. been in for thirty years. Uh, when he retired, um, you know, he worked his way up the the ranks and and so I think that was the job and and that was the model that I had in my mind so you, and so so did you think you were going to go and be a bobby then was that yeah is that what yeah that honestly that that that's what I wanted to do and when I was thinking about universities um I I was initially wanted to go and do sort of sports science that's really what I was interested in and and got encouraged to go and do something different uh, actually by the sports teacher who I was with and um, I was doing biology and chemistry at the time uh, at A level and so you know I look, I look back to the career advice that you know probably we all got back then and yeah. I, I, it wasn't particularly structured rich the career advice it was more just do the things that you're interested in and I was interested in biology interested in chemistry and so so I, I, I want to go and do biochemistry right and, this, and is, this is not particularly lining up with the police then no, it's not. And and I, I think that, you know, it was this idea of go to university, but go to university with a view to doing that and then um finding a route into the police. Which is um which is what I set out to do and 
uh, I'd had a couple of friends locally, family friends who'd gone to Leeds. And, yeah. and, and so really that, that was as far as I could see, honestly, Rich, you know, the, I, I could kind of see Newcastle and I could see Leeds yeah. because I had some friends who'd gone there and, and really that, that's how I ended up at Leeds doing, uh, doing biochemistry. So it doesn't sound like you were growing up sort of desperately wanting to get away from the little town that you were in. You were perhaps thinking, "Hey, this is this. this there might be a, you know, a job in the police or a role around here that you'd seen your dad working hard at and getting on at." Yeah, I, th- I mean, I could, I can tell you. I remember the going, the day going to university. I was devastated that I was going. I had a girlfriend at home at the time, and um, you know, the idea of leaving a close group of friends and 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 leaving. Yeah. Um, you know, I remember getting there thinking, what on earth have I done? <laughs> Leeds was a shock then. <laughs> it, it, Leeds in September was cold and it was grey, even more cold and grey than, than, than Newcastle. And, and it like rained every day for the first few months. And, and, I, and, I, was play, I, and I had this, uh, I think I'd bought a Travis album in my, right. first, yeah. in, my first, in my first week there. And I played this Travis album on, on, on loop. And uh, even now, if I put a song on, uh, Andrea, my wife says, oh my goodness, that song's so depressing. Why does it always <laughs> rain on me? But exactly. So I played that and I played that in Leeds and oh my goodness, yeah. I remember thinking, what have I done? So you so you get to Leeds then. Yeah. Um sounds like it's a bit of a culture shock. Uh how do you start to settle in? How do you sort of make the best of that then? I I, I think, you know, you, you, you do what anybody from the northeast does at at that point, which is you put your Newcastle shirt on and you go and stand <laughs> in the bar. <laughs> You go and stand in the bar in university campus and uh, and and get to talk to people. And you know, I I I'd, I'd played a lot of football growing up, and and I, and I, I enjoyed it a lot. I was uh, you know I, I was okay, and 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 I got to play for the university football team. And you know, I, I think it actually in some ways, you know, that was something which really started to open my eyes a little because of the. The, divi- the diversity of people that I met there and met, you know, playing on football teams and, the, and, and, and you know, these lads from, you know, very different backgrounds who, you know, had different experiences, had seen different things, viewed the world in a different way and, you know, started to get me to, to think about what I wanted to do and, and where I wanted to go. So Well, that's, that's quite interesting because you are very accomplished now at working with people from lots of different nationalities you've led multinational teams um particularly multi sort of european teams and 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 you know now you've got people from all over the states canadians things like that so did those early experiences teach you stuff then about you know people from different backgrounds even though it might not have been as multinational as that you know i i would say that if i look to then the the biggest thing that I took from those experiences, I think, was just a broadening of horizons, you know, and 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 the idea that, you know, by engaging with different people, by talking to different people, learning about them, you know, you you can start to shape how you see things, hmm. and uh, and 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 get different perspectives. So I I'd say, looking back, not necessarily from a cultural standpoint, but just just mindset and worldview, um, mm. yeah. You know, th- those were definitely the big things. So, so did this give you any wonderlust? Then did it make you think, oh, you know, I want to get out there and explore the world a bit more, or, w- or were you craving to get back to the little town in uh, north of Newcastle? But, uh, honestly, probably a bit of both. Uh, I, I mean, you know, for the majority of my time in, in Leeds, I still intended to go into the police, yeah. and um, and so. My intention was, you know, I think once I settled there and I wanted to keep going and keep exploring. And so I was, I wanted to head to London and go and join the Met. Right. So that was my, that was what I decided I wanted to do. And, and I applied at the time for what was called the Accelerated Promotion Scheme for Graduates. Okay. And yeah. it was a graduate scheme. And the idea was that, you know, if, if you, if you, you were successful onto the scheme, you ended up in a job. Uh, you, you did your probation within two years and then you had to pass some exams. And so long as you pass your exams, then, uh, you, you know, you would progress to a certain rank within a certain period of time. And so that that's what I'd set out to do. And, um, and had you got a certain goal in mind? You know, was there a certain role that you wanted to reach or a certain rank that you wanted to reach? Because it sounds like you'd you'd already thought, hey, I, I don't just want to be a, a policeman. I, 
I, I want to have a career. I want to be a career policeman. I, I wanted to lead. I wanted to be a leader. And and I wanted to, you know, it was the conflation of that with what I thought that I knew at the time, which was, you know, I wanted to get into the police. So it was, you know, how do I go and lead through that? That's it. That's interesting, Michael. What What was it about leadership specifically that attracted you? What were the... What what kind of led you to th- that thinking? You know, I'd, I'd always enjoyed that aspect of things, Ricky, even just being at school, you know, I was probably, you know, I was, I'd be the one who would, you know, offer to 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 get people together to go and, you know, lead an idea or a initiative. I, I remember small things, you know, the people I went to school with, they, they all wanted to, uh, they all wanted to wear a certain thing in school. And so I, I decided to run an initiative to go and make sure that we were allowed to wear what we wanted in school. I remember during the World Cup in 98, you know, kind of going around and canvassing support to to take everybody from school to the the local club to go and watch England versus Argentina during the day while we were at school. It was a lunchtime kickoff, wasn't it? Yeah, Yeah, and and taking everyone, you know, up to school and, and then me being the one who ended up on the hook for it, you know, the next day when... The, the teachers found out that uh, so many people were out of school and who had who had sort of led the brigade up there. So there was a bit of almost like campaigning involved here as well, not just leading but fighting a cause. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd yeah, I'd, I'd say so. I, I think I had this uh, I- I- immoral compass, for want of a better word, and you know they pointed in a certain direction, and so would take it upon myself to uh, to try and go and, and lead and feel like I was doing the. The right thing and I was captain of the football team and took on responsibilities at school and and these sorts of things so I but I enjoy I, I just enjoyed doing those things I enjoyed being the one who was who was responsible for for any of these things and um and and still am right and and so I I think mm. that was the that was so the thing were, that so you so you enjoyed responsibility accountability yeah I, mean, I like I like the one I like being the one who's on the hook for the thing Tell us more about that. Why do you, why does that appeal to you? What, I, I, what I, I, yeah, I, I, I don't know what that is, Rich, but I, I, I like being responsible for, um, you know, for, for, the, for the people that I was around, you know, whether that was, you know, when I was younger, whether that was playing football or, 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 or being at school or being out with friends or, you know, we'd, we'd go on holiday and if there was ever an issue, you know, I'd, I, I'd go down to the reception in the hotel to go and sort out and, you know, I just... You know, I just I, I don't know why I just and and en, en, enjoyed that I think it's just that 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 desire to want to do that I think mm. is just a it's just an inherent thing really was there was, was that driven by the perception of others that they look to you for somebody who would take control of a difficult situation thinking about your you know problem with the hotel or actually we're two nil down and we need to kind of move in a different kind of way in order to to get back into it so to speak i i don't remember and i, I think to now I, I i don't know that it's driven externally ricky i think it's just that that part of it you know is 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 just a, an element of who I am and I've I've thought a lot obviously over the years about values and the things that make me me and you know that that's definitely part of it and and I, listen I think the same with anything you know sometimes these things have a have a dark side and a light side mm. you know it, yeah. the, the, you know there's a desire to go and put myself forward to take on responsibility and you, you know maybe the dark side is maybe I'm I'm too often willing to to do that or too too often craving to go and take on the next piece of responsibility rather than just kind of be in the moment. So I wonder, yeah. I wonder is has that had any detrimental impact where you've kind of stepped forward because that's in your in your DNA, others have gone, oh thank thank thankful that Michael stepped forward so we don't have to and then that's kind of caught you out in terms of anything or has there yeah, been anything it, that's caught you out? I suppose. You know, I, 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 I don't know. I don't know, Ricky. It's, it's a good question. I, I don't know that I can necessarily think of an example where I felt that I've been caught out as a result of stepping forward. I mean, I, you know, I, I can think of times that I've stepped forward and then it, it, it it's not been a, it's not been an easy scenario. I mean, but, mm. um, 
but but I that that's really what I I want as well, right? I enjoy that. You enjoy the challenge. You enjoy yeah. it. Yeah. If you enjoy leading to hear, listen to our sister podcast. The question is by Thinking Focus. So let, let's let's go back. So what happened with the Met then? You apply to the Met. So I applied to the Met and. Uh, you know, I think back to that. So that was all I wanted to do when I applied to the Met. And they had this process and you had to have yeah. your application in. So I got my application in and and I, and I called them and I checked up on it. And yes, we've received it. And, and months went by, Rich, and I never heard anything. And and I, and I think I saw somewhere that someone had been yeah. for an interview or something had happened, which again led me to call them. And I said, you know, I've, I've not heard anything i've not had my interview yet you know is everything okay and they and, and the long short of it was uh oh yes well actually we got too many applications this year so we, we just didn't get around to reading yours so we put it in the bin wow and, um, <laughs> so, well, <laughs> so how, how did how did that feel you've got all uh, these years of uh, hopes on this i was, I was devastated <laughs> someone's you know? literally just put it in the bin they, they, they did genuinely. That that was the answer. They said we we had we got too many, so we just cut it off at the number that we got last year. And we put the rest in the bin, and yours was one of them. And I said to oh, you, oh. I said you didn't even read it. So nice. you so you wish you'd have had a surname of Armisen as opposed to Smith. You might have been in that first cut. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. So I, I so no, what, I was I was real disappointed, Rich. So with, what with did that. you do? Was that the end of the police dream, or how did you pick yourself up? Well, you you know, I I I guess I I I did what I do in those situations, which is you know, I, first of all, I went into action mode. Yeah. So you know, and much to the amusement of my even my wife today and and friends around me, I wrote, I didn't just let it go. I wrote to the the commissioner of the Met <laughs> so the camp- at that time. The campaigner comes back out here. With Sir, Sir John Stevens and I wrote to David Blunkett, the Home Secretary at the time, to express yeah. my immense dissatisfaction. <laughs> <laughs> and at the, at, at the process, I did, I did, I, 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 I did, and uh, they, they offered me a spot, um, um, uh, in there, and um, and 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 I think I just, I, I felt this disillusionment with the process and this this morality that I'd been treated unfairly came out, and so, in the end, you know, I said thanks, but. No thanks, and uh, so they offered you a spot on the program in the end, but you you turned it down. <laughs> yeah, which which yeah, and um, and so just just decided to move on, and 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 so I I went from the spot of of knowing exactly what I wanted to do to you know now everyone else around me's got these jobs, hmm. many of which I couldn't tell you at the time what they did, right? But they sounded kind of fancy. Mm-hmm. And um and, and started to look for something. And so I remember vividly sitting in the university library, going into Google and searching for graduate jobs. And this 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 link came up, this advert that said inexperience essential. And I thought, great, <laughs> that's me. <laughs> that's me. And where was and, this? Where where um, where were you looking? It it was it, and so what I found was a, a a recruitment agency, a staffing agency for sales jobs. You've made a bit of a leap though here. Then you're now looking at, at sales stuff. Was but that, it, was that it, just because it, it was inexperienced? D- genuinely, it was. It was because it said inexperienced essential, and as I looked at it, it said for a job in sales, this is what you look for. And it was a it was a specialist graduate sales recruitment agency, and they said you need to have these ten things to be in sales. And I thought I can do those things, and so I I, I sent off my my CV, my resume, and. Uh, a couple of days later, I got a phone call from them, and they, they phoned me to do a phone screen, and I and I yeah. couldn't even remember that I'd sent my resume off to these people because I I think I probably sent it off to twenty different companies yeah. at the time, and they tried mm-hmm. to do a phone interview, and in the end, the the, the lady who talked to me said, "It doesn't seem like you're particularly well prepared for this, Michael. Perhaps we should organize a time to to schedule this," and so. She did, and and I did, and got prepared, and 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 went from there. And was that that was at Vigon? Is that right? It 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 was for a company that recruited into Vigon and and multiple other different med device companies. And and so I went I went down. I passed their assessment center, and they said to me, "What sort of sales do you want to do?" And I said, "I'll sell anything." And they said, "Where do you want to work?" And I said, "I'll work anywhere." <laughs> and they said, "Well, you you realize I could be working up in Aberdeen selling nuts and bolts." And I said, "Well, if that's the case, then that's okay." 
and um and 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 what happened was that i guess somebody in the in the recruitment firm looked at my cv i did medical biochemistry at oh. university and so they put me forward for a medical sales job at a at a company called vigon and, and that was uh that was it wow <laughs> it's amazing isn't it you know just listening to you talk when you reflect quite often how much some of these things are by chance so not only that um so I, I moved to Vigon and, and I'd been there for a year and one of my closest friends from university uh, had gone off traveling for a year after university and he uh, he got back and uh, when he got back from his year travel, I'd, I'd, I'd had to get a job and I'd, and, and I'd already oh, been in a yeah. year. By this point, I'd already been promoted. And so he calls me up and he says, so this thing that you're doing, tell me about it. Basically, if a bozo like you <laughs> can get a job and get promoted within a year then maybe i'll take a look at that and so i connected him with this recruitment firm yeah and and he went through their process he ended up getting a job at what is now medtronic yeah and on his first day there he met my now wife who he introduced oh, okay. me to a few years later so so not only is it an interesting sequence of events or the serendipity of me end up there but but those same things are what me to led me to meet Andrea as well. Wow. Well, hell. Um, so you, well, perhaps we'll come on to that then at, at that point and how you and Andrea got together in this story. But what what were Vigon doing in Med Device? What was what what is or what was their their speciality? Yeah, so they, they so they're still their great company. Um, so they're multinational, uh, privately held. They 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 did and do a lot of. Um, single-use critical care theater products and um i just i was incredibly fortunate in that uh they 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 decided they wanted to try a different model they they, they'd hire people who didn't have experience straight out of university trained them up and and i worked and 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 it was a great company because they really they cared about development they invested in their people and and i had a great boss uh caroline who you know, from very early on was just, she was so supportive of, of me. And, and so I moved down to London, uh, straight yeah. away within a, within a week of, or a month of, of leaving university and, uh, and, and, and got to work there. So I, I worked across London and the Southeast of England and I spent my time in, in hospitals and theater and critical care. And, um, you talk about Caroline, your first boss. Yeah. So when you reflect and look back, from the position that you find yourself in now, we often see some of the people that we work with that the first real boss kind of quite an impression on them. Is was that the yeah. case for you? And, and yeah. so, what did what did you learn from her? What are the what are the ghosts of her leadership are rattling around in your leadership today? Yeah, she, I, I mean, she was great. I mean, she she just took such an interest in in me. She was so supportive of of, of me. You know, she she tried to connect me with people in. London yeah. um she really looked after me like genuinely looked after me and and then from a from a career standpoint she spent time with me she she she'd be out with me she'd coach and uh, and again I remember vividly her saying to me you know what do you want to do from a career standpoint and I said you know I don't really know you know I, want, I know I want to lead and I keep progressing and but she said to me well you know Michael you'd never get in a taxi and just say just drive me anywhere yeah, take and, me anywhere. You know, you, you should you should apply the same thing. You know, get clear on what you want to do, and and so she was. She really helped and was supportive of that, and I, and I, and I you know, was obviously a big influence. And then within a short space of time, um, you know, sponsoring me to to move on, and and so I within a within a year, I moved to Bristol to to uh, to manage the the southwest and Ireland for for Vigon. So what? happens then so you've started to move through you've got this promotion you've got a bigger role now you've got the region you've got all that sort of stuff is ambition starting to kick in at what point does that make I, you think you know i, 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 I want to I take think i always further. had it yeah i i mean i i always had it i i think i i, I told a I, I told a story at, at the at the beginning of the of one of the books that i wrote where i said i remember being walking around this this hospital in london I must have knocked on five or six doors that morning, got absolutely nowhere, and uh, and I remember just throwing, going down to the car in the car park, throwing the bag in the back, and and just sort of sitting there, car thinking, what on earth am I doing? 
here. Mm. You know, it's just it's just not what I want to do. And um, you know, and and then the, you know, because I I wanted to be with people. I I I wanted to be out there, but managing people, leading people, and so the the chance to go and do that so quickly. You know, I kind of really ran it, and um, you know, it was uh, it was great. You know, that was what I wanted to do, and. You know, so I, I I remember kind of just enthusiastically, you know, starting to read as many management books as I could and, you know, trying to get educated on certain things because I was only, I was 20, I was 22, 23 and, and I yeah. moved into this management job where I was managing people who were 40 and 50 and had been at this a long time and, you know, so that I was very aware of that, very conscious of that and, you know, so, so tried to get try to get educated and show up in the best way that I could. How did the experience feel having now got into that position of management and leadership and responsibility for a bigger number for people and their performance and their development? How did that play out in reality compared to what you imagined it might be? I mean, I, I remember you know, just feeling like I, I got a, a, a real education within the first couple of years. You know, I, rem- I remember, you know, not just the, the, the hiring aspect of this, which obviously was new, um, but I had people go off on long-term sick. I had people who, you know, they, 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 they broke up from their partner. They got thrown out of their house, you know, having to fire people for misconduct. You know, all of these things happened within a real short space of time. You know, when when you're in it, you're thinking, like, my goodness, what you, you know, it's kind of coming, you know, fairly fast, fast here. Yeah. But but looking back, you know, it was like a real ex- accelerated education for me. And so, in subsequent years, people would say to me, you know, how how did you end up in this type of role so young? And and I would always point to the fact that I was fortunate. That I was given an opportunity very early but then almost had this accelerated learning curve um, very early as well. So it was just just all all around, I mean, looking back, just a great experience. Because they're not the things you imagine management leadership to be, is, you know, firing people for misconduct and losing people on long-term sick. You know, the, the imagined future, certainly if I remember my early leadership career, is, you know, you get to kind of, you know, be the steering the ship and guiding the troops and helping them to get where they need to get to. But actually, it comes with some baggage, this stuff. And I think, um, you know, I can definitely relate to this accelerated learning process of, you know, people. Managing yeah. people is more complex than anybody ever imagines it to be before they before they get in there, isn't it? It, it it does, but, but you know, I I look back and I and I think that you know very very early on with Caroline and with moving into this management role so early, you know, it, it's not about it's not about me, it's not about the leader, right? It's about oh. the, the, it's about the people and how do you best serve those serve those people and and sometimes that means making difficult choices, but um, oh. you know, I, I, it was definitely very very formative for me. Leader, leader. Leading to hear. If you're a leader and have a story to tell, reach out at hello at thinkingfocus.com. So you do, what, three and a bit years at Vigon? And uh, then, yeah. And then, yeah. We, you know, you, you move on to Johnson & Johnson, is that right? Yeah, I, yeah and, and so, you know, I, I think looking back, I remember thinking, you know, I, I, I want to get into a bigger organisation. I want to try something different. Um, and so I end up in in J and J and their orthopedic company. Decided to go back into the northeast. I wanted to get back out and 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 be in front of customers and sell. I felt that I wanted to learn a little more, you know, in terms of just being out there. And so I went back into a sales role. But it, it, again, it didn't last very long. Uh, the, the 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 boss that I worked for he he moved on. And um, and they needed someone to take on the, the the management role in that area, so I stepped into that and, and and then moved on from there. But you know, it was around about that point that I I wanted to get into marketing, to product marketing, 
Um, right. You know, I, I, I was doing an MBA part time um, while um, while working. And, you know, I had this this desire, this enthusiasm to, you know, to continue to learn, to continue to progress and and, and being part of J and J, you know, you were in this multinational structure and, you know, I wanted to I wanted to take advantage of those opportunities as well and go and do different things and get into different roles and be in different places. So this this leads you back up to the northeast, so you you're somewhere back to close to close to home. Because it, it feels I can already see a pattern, Michael, where you're quite happy to at this point, up to this point, to to move around. You quite it, it doesn't bother you that you're quite happy to go. Well, the job's down in Bristol. I'll I'll go down there, or I need to be in London. Well, yeah, I'll I'll go there. Yes, and I, I remember at the time feeling like I just want I want I wanted to get back up into the northeast, which 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 worked out well in that you know it, it was only a couple of years after being back up there that my mum started to be ill and and she ended up dying after 12 months uh with with cancer but you know i'm again i feel grateful that i was back up in the northeast for that period it was only three years that i was back up in the northeast but but fortunate that that i was there for 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 that period and um but then you know had um really it was you know the the timing of it was was fortunate and and then I ended up back in back in Leeds, which is where the next job was, and the chance to go and do an international job for JJ. You, you mentioned, you know, you you lost your mum. Now, you and I have talked quite a bit in the past about trying to find the right balance in your work with family. Did that start to sow a seed, perhaps right back then, that it was good that you were somewhere close to home around that time when your mum wasn't well? I, I don't. I don't know that it did, Rich. I, I mean, I, I think I felt fortunate that I was back up in the northeast at that point. Um, but you know, I was also doing two jobs for a period of that time and and doing an MBA. And yeah. um, you know, Andrea at the time was living in Prague, and we okay. were we were we were dating, and so I was. So you got an international you know, relationship going on as well. Yeah, I was. I was. Split, I, was I, w- I was. I was spreading my time across in very disparate and you know, diverse places and people. So this international role comes up at J&J. So this is where you start to dip your toe into working internationally. So just tell us a little about that and what you learned there. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think as soon as, um, as soon as I saw, you know, what these international marketing, the, the international marketing did, I, I, you know, I, I, I thought that's what I want to go and do. You know, that's what I want to go and do next. I mean, it just looked like they had an amazing job. You know, they got to not only from a professional standpoint, you know, define, you know, product strategy, brand strategy. Um, they got to travel all over the world. They got to go and engage with all these different teams, different, different countries. And, and I thought that, that, that's, that's what I want to do. And then it looked like an amazing thing. And it was, it was just a, it was a, it was a fantastic experience. And, you know, I, I remember maybe a year or so in, I'd gone to meet a design surgeon in Rome um, who had who had designed one of the products that we had. And so I spent a day in surgery with him. And then after surgery, um, I went back to his uh, I went back to his uh, apartment in Rome and he said, right, we're going out for dinner. Um, mm. He said, uh, you get in the sidecar and <laughs> we'll head out to dinner. So he, he, he rides his motorcycle with me in the sidecar so around, like the streets, and around the streets <laughs> of Rome. <laughs> Um, and to this restaurant to, you know, have a nice meal and have a glass of wine. And and I, and I, I remember being in the sidecar thinking, you know, how on earth did I end up, you know, being, in the, <laughs> be, being driving around the streets of Rome for work? Um, and uh, I, I don't know how I really ended up here, but it was, it was I, I, I loved that job and, and that experience. It was just, uh, it was, uh, it was great. So you moved really quite quickly then through some more senior roles at J&J so there's a there's a again there's a bit of a pattern here of you is this because you're a combination of your ambition your results and your drive and you're getting noticed because you move through you move through a few roles quite quickly by by the sounds yeah. of it yeah I, I again I think I was I was fortunate that um you know I had good people around me people who wanted to support me and help me and give me opportunities to do different things and um 
you know, one of those people was uh, one of those people was 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 Raf, um, you know, who who ran orthopedics at the time for for J and J. You know, it was it was because of him that I ended up then uh, leaving J and J and 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 moving on to a line. So you give Raf a name check there. Just to expand a little bit because you know our listeners won't necessarily know who Raf is. Yeah, so 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 Raf um, Raf Paco. So he he ran orthopedics at the time for uh, for J and J in uh, in international, and um, you know he 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 left kind of out the blue to go and join a company that nobody had heard of um, mm. at, at that point in time, and uh, and I still have the email that that, that he sent me. Uh, he and I spent a bit of time together. We'd done some trips together at uh, at J and J and. You know, so he sent me an email, and uh, I can pretty much remember it verbatim. It said, "You know, I've been here for four days, and even in the short space of time, I know that it's a place where you and I could make a difference. Do you want to talk about a job?" Wow! And See. so, yeah, I yeah. did. So I called him and said, "Yeah." So went and met him, and uh, and said, "Listen, why don't you come along and come and run Europe?" And you know, that so, was uh, that was it. So tell us about your next move. Raf sends you an email. Tell us about the company you went to join and and what was going on there. You said you were going to run Europe. Yeah, so I, the the company was Align Technology Invisalign and Itero, and, and and at the time nobody really knew who they were. They were kind of like a fringy, hmm. out there, you know, dental company that was almost at the time like it's you know you go from J and J and orthopedics to this fringy med device tech company that nobody really has ever heard of, and so. You know, there was a bit. I guess there was a bit of a risk involved in there, and uh, and it meant being out based in Amsterdam. So you know, I'd I'd leave Leeds on a Monday morning and fly out to Amsterdam and spend the week there. So Andrea comes home, and you go off to Amsterdam. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> pretty much, yeah. And um, and so, but again, I remember being. I remember arriving in Amsterdam on the first day and walking from the tram station to the office, thinking. What on earth have I signed up for? Like, what what, what, have, <laughs> what have I have committed I to? <laughs> and just just to expand on that a bit. We often talk in the work we do with leaders about imposter, what's known as imposter syndrome. We often try and use Adam Grant's uh, Adam Grant, the organisational psychologist. Yes. He talks about imposter thoughts, and yes. that seems to resonate more. You feeling that at any point through this? No, I I, I don't I, I don't think so. I I don't think that I've I've ever felt you know like I didn't deserve or belong there in terms of the role, right? Because I, I, I was always, and I still always, I, I, I don't know that you're ever necessarily ready for the next role, right? I just wanted mm. to do it. I wanted mm. that responsibility. I was doing jobs that I wanted to do. Uh, but, but, you know, I think it's the change, right? It's such the big change of, you know, everything was work and doing this, and now I've completely torn it up. And now I've committed to being here five days a week, um, mm. you know, with 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 a with a with a girlfriend, fiance, wife, family, somewhere else. Hang on a minute, you didn't have all those at that time. Probably not. Which one not. was she? Pro- Which one was she? <laughs> probably not. I, well, I, I, I just want to check that they were all the same person. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they were. They were definitely all the same person. I, and I, and I think at that point, when when I moved to Align, we we just got we'd only recently been married, so. Only recently married, and uh, and then me committing to being away for f- effectively five days a week, you know, for you know, for the foreseeable future, you know, you kind of look around and realize I don't know anybody, you know, I have no network, um, you know, I'm starting out again, and um, you know, it that, that it definitely feels character building. Yeah, definitely. Now, you then. Tell us a little bit about your role. So you were director of sales for EMEA, for Align Technology. You build a team, I'm assuming. You yeah. Know, it's, and it sounds like it's it's almost like startup by the sounds of it. It was. But I mean, back, back in the day, I mean, I, I think Align was about a $50 million business in Europe at the time. Um, yeah, Align was maybe $350 million worldwide. So it was still fairly small, entrepreneurial. We, we were a small satellite, basically, of... Uh, a slightly mm. larger organization um you know whereas i look now and the lines of four billion dollar business worldwide you know amir is a billion dollar business so it's, it's in a very different spot now to to when it was but it was um it was great we got to try things and do things and build things and you know take a chance and a bunch of stuff didn't work out and some of it did and and it was uh 
it was just a great it was just a great experience and and and, and that 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 first that first day you know I, I remember going there and you know I saw my you know my name and title on the door and then at the end of the day uh Claudia who's still there who runs HR she came into my office she brings me a bottle of beer in and I remember taking <laughs> yeah. a photograph of the bottle of beer in my office and sending it to Andrea and saying you know I, again I can't believe that I'm doing this I'm in this office in Amsterdam and you know, I'm sitting drinking a bottle of beer at the end of the day. How how did I end up doing this? Michael, you talked about um, you got to try some stuff and not everything worked. What was the um, what was the attitude around failure in the business at that time? Um, you know, I, I think the, the the culture was very entrepreneurial, right? It was just give things a try and try and figure it out. Um, you know, take some risks and 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 it's okay if it doesn't work, but but kind of let's assess as quickly as possible that it didn't work and then and then move on, move on, move on to the next thing let's not dwell on it for too long that's quite a big thing is you know in organizations particularly with aggressive growth plans taking chances needs a, a level of psychological safety you need to feel comfortable that you'd certainly got raf there to protect to support to yeah. make sure that you know yes we are not everything's going to work out and and the, that's a reality whatever but it's how people feel about that so we we lean on quite a lot this are you playing not to lose or are you playing to win and yeah. they are very different mindsets yeah yeah, I mean, I, again, I I think I was very fortunate that I had someone like Raf there who was, you know, he was very driven, entrepreneurial in his thinking, willing to try things and and encourage me to do the same things. And so I, I operated from a position, I think, of safety, of confidence, of knowing that yep. he had my back and we could try things and I could try things and he would, you know, he'd be there to to help out if needs be. So, and, and again, I, I've, I've sort of tried to take that, with me and uh and apply that to the things that i've done since and things that i do now and you know i i like to try different things i like to get different initiatives in flight and 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 see how they work out and be okay with the fact that listen you know we're going to screw some stuff up and um you know that's okay we're we're, we're trying to do good work and we're, we're trying to build and create and it's not a it's not a linear thing mm. right it's 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 mm. very up and down raf's becoming a an influential part in your career at this stage and you know what have you what have you learned from him over the years that have shaped you as a leader no he 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 was and still is and you know i often think about you know in a particular situation you know how would raf approach it i i think back and i think he was incredibly he has a huge capacity you know, which which I, I've 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 tried to learn from and try to emulate. You know, he's he was able to be across so many different things in terms of the breadth of initiatives, but also be able to go into the detail of them. You know, he he was a engineer, you know, a sales guy, a marketing guy, and that confluence of different characteristics. I think it was very formative for for him. You know, so I, I tried to learn from that. You know, he was very creative. I've tried to, uh, I've tried to emulate some of those things. Leading to here, for mental models and tools for leaders, visit our YouTube channel, Thinking Focus. Three three years or so at Align, and then you take a bit of a different direction. So tell us about what next. You mentioned a while ago. You'd written books. So what happens next then after three really successful years at Align, the business is growing, you're doing really well, you then take a bit of a different direction? Yes, I I, I had what I describe as a bit of an entrepreneurial itch and, you know, I, I'd had this this desire to want to, uh, to start my own business. And so, you know, I'd talked to Align about doing the next job there and, and what that would look like. And, and in the end, I just said, you listen at this point, I want to go and just try something different for a while. And, um, and so did, and, and so, you know, wrote a book on, 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 on selling. Andrea had at this point set up a, 
a company developed edge, which was doing sales training, sales consulting. And, uh, and she was going out and, you know, she would, she, she'd left her corporate job. And so she was going out and, and taking ideas and models and concepts into, into small businesses. And so, you know, I, I, I left a line and, and took my ideas and added them to hers and, and, and we went out and, think by definition of the network that we had we end up niching into again healthcare med tech med devices and yeah um you know we 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 started to build that out and and create products and programs for med tech med device companies to help drive their sales and marketing efforts and uh and so you know wrote a handful of professional qualifications and another book and some ebooks and um got to go and you know spend time with all these the company i think i worked with 25 companies you know in in a couple yeah. of years so it was uh it was great just name check your books michael <laughs> so I, I th- so the, the 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 first one i wrote was uh was gone was gone naked um uh, revealing the secrets of successful selling and then the second one uh i'd used the same uh the same idea the same concept gone naked uh, but the second one, I'd niche down into how to be successful within med device sales, and so that became more of a process type of process type of book. And um, yeah, kind of went from there. And then, but over that time, had stayed in touch with the line. I'd continued to do some work with them, and um, and talked about some different things over that time. And and in the end, um, you know. Raf was still there in a different job and it said, listen, we've restructured. Do you, do you, do you want to come back and run part of their business? And, and so that's, that's what I decided to do. And, and I think ultimately rich, the reason that I did that was I, 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 the run and developed edge and doing that work. It was a very enjoyable period in my mm. career and, and life. Um, but I, I think I just felt that I operated better uh, and I could have more of an impact within within an organization. And and, uh-huh. and I felt Align was a real good fit for me, actually. So you got an opportunity then. So almost, you know, Raf, I think, comes back to you and says, hey, what do you think about coming and doing something for me? And correct me if I'm wrong, but this gives you an opportunity to then make an international, a, a big international move for you and, and the family at this point. Yeah, I mean, so I, I took I took on a, a a broader global role. Um, you know, I did it out of Europe for eighteen months or so. But you know, the the all the while we were planning, uh, we were planning to move to the US, and so, and so that's what we did. And um, so I would I, again, I spent those that first year or so, um, you know, traveling most weeks and 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 being out uh, in different markets and doing different things. And um, uh, but my my team was in San Jose, and so th- that was. That was where I ended up, and, and why I had end up heading out to California. Just, just elaborate a bit. You know, what did you learn as you get? You've you've managed people right across Europe, so you had people that reported to you from all different bits of Europe. You now find yourself, and you're still in the states today. What are some of the cultural differences, and and how has that affected you as a leader, leading these people that are from all over the world? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think. Um, you know, there are there are right and, and and you know even you know between the US and the UK I, I think you know there's often a belief that you know we speak the same language and therefore you know there's 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 um you know it's the same and it's just it's just it's just not the case <laughs> you know I, I think for a you know for you know, probably a, a dry witted you know you know <laughs> at times sarcastic lad from the northeast you know often that doesn't necessarily fit well with you know what can be a very literal sense of humor in the u.s <laughs> uh and i and i probably still stumble over that yeah. uh now but uh but no i i i think you know getting to work with people from across asia and 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 different parts of europe and the u.s uh i, I again i've just been very fortunate to have been able to do that and uh learn to turn and you know I, I if I think about the things that I'd say I feel that I um, I'm good at one of them is you know I, I feel that I listen well and and I try to understand and so that that's really how I've approached things you know where, wherever I've been and you know that these different roles and countries and, and people I've, I've tried 
to understand. And so, you know, while I'm sure there are people who feel that I've done, you know, better or worse in certain roles or companies than others, um, you know, hopefully the people that I've engaged with will would 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 feel like I'd taken the time to understand them and what they were doing and their their market, their job, their role, their specific scenario. So giving people space, listening, understanding, trying to meet yeah. who they are, these are all fundamental parts of your leadership style. Yeah, I, 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 I um, they're things that are important to, to, to me in terms of how I show up and, and hopefully pe- people feel that as well. So you become Vice President, Global Product Marketing Innovation and Ortho Channel out in California. How's the family settled? Because you've got kids by this point. You're out there in the sunshine, not too far from the beach, I think. So yeah. how, how, how's the family start to settle? Because you've made a massive commitment here now that's, that's not just about you. You know, when you were younger, you moved to Bristol, whatever. Now you're taking the family out to, out to California. How, how, do they, how do they accept it? How do, how do they settle in? Um, yeah, so I, when I, when I moved out, I had three, three kids, you know, we had a fourth out in California. Uh, I mean, I, I was very fortunate, Rich, in that, you know, I had, uh, Andrea with me who, you know, she, she took on all of that work, right. In terms of integration and, uh, you know, helping us get settled and building a network and a community and, you know, making sure that the kids were, were settled in school and, and doing those things. And, and she, you know, she took on all of that. I mean, I was, even though I was in California, I was still traveling and um, mm. away for, for, you know, proportion of the time, you know, probably, you know, I was away a little too much and mm. uh, put, you know, I look back and put too much of the burden on her to do that work. Um, but, but was very fortunate because she, she, she does that, did that incredibly well and, um, and, and, and help them get, get sort of settled in and, and integrated into where we were. And she's, you know, very talented, Andrea, and she is very good at bringing people together. She's also a leader herself, isn't she? So you've you've got two sort of leadership candidates in both of you in the house, and and she's very. I suppose this move actually played to some of her strengths, really, because she's good at going out there and making things happen. Yeah, I, mean, I tell her her superpower is just bringing people together, like this magnetism of yeah. uh of connecting people so you know it's um she's she she's very good at it and you know she's she's done that she's done that well here and i, and I can say that because fortunately uh fortunately i've i've got to know andrea through working with you michael over the years so you, you you're out there you 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 live in in california align's a great company to be at you're doing a great job but then it, you know again you you decide to move to senendo so what and and what, what what was the difference between a line and Senendo, and what starts to go through your mind at this point of your leadership journey um, that this is the move that you want to make? I assumed that I'd be at a line for the rest of my career, honestly, Rich. Yeah. Um, and you know, I had no intention to go anywhere else. And you know, then someone got in touch on behalf of Senendo, and I started to talk to them and. And and again, I you know I, I wanted to, yeah, I wanted to to do an exec level role, and I wanted to have broader responsibility, and I wanted to be accountable for for things on a daily basis. And um, you know, Senendo, that's what was that's what was offered up for me. And um, you know, it, it the other thing was I I think I saw some parallels to a line you know from back in you know the early two thousands. Yeah, um, you know, smaller company, disruptive technology, big market opportunity, and um, you know, with a with a with a great technology, and you know, I think I just thought the chance to get in on the relative ground floor with that type of company and do the type of work that I wanted to do. Um, you know, my my assessment was then and still now that, that there's not many of those opportunities that. that that, that, that come along so um so it meant another move and you know we moved from northern california down to southern california which is you know it's 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 a it's an eight hour drive between the the two points so mm-hmm. it wasn't sort of it was another relocation and um yeah and and that that was that was how i ended up here it's your first exec position as well so tell us about some of the learnings that you've had around 
you know, moving from those roles just underneath exec level to, to now you are right up there at the, at the, at the top of the company and, and how have you had to adapt and what have you learned about operating in that environment? Yeah. You know, it's interesting when I, when I, when I moved to Sanendo and I, and I left the line and, and I talked to, um, when I talked to Joe about it, he said to me, you know, listen, Michael, it's a small company, you know, like, is that really what you want to go and who's, do? Who's Joe, Michael, just for, sorry. So for Joe, Joe Hogan, Joe Hogan, who's a, who is the, the president and CEO of, at, at Align. And, you know, he'd said to me, it's just, that's a small company, Michael. Like, do you really want to go and do that? Um, you know, Align was a $4 billion business and Sonendo was a $40 million business. And I think at the time, you know, when he asked his question, I, I thought, you know, he's coming at it from a place of like, is there going to be enough for me? Is it going to be yeah. interesting enough, challenging enough, complex enough? And, um, and now as I reflect on that, I, I don't, that's not the issue. That's not the challenge. The challenge mm-hmm. that we have is that, you know, we're a relatively small company early on in our development, right? So the challenges that we have are often an issue of scale. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, they're a consequence of just organizational maturity where, where we are in our development. Um, and, you know, so, so being, being in the type of role that I'm in and having to, navigate through those challenges is um you know is is again just a great is a great learning experience um but the chance to the chance to build and create and shape and um you know have again have great people around me it's just a yeah i feel very fortunate that i'm that i'm able to that i'm able to do that Michael, how how does your leadership skills how how do they differ in your your new role with perhaps not the army of people around you that you might have had at a line? I'm making a leap there, given the size and scale of the between the two. Um, how, how is your leadership style different in the new role compared to the last role that you had aligned? I think my, in terms of my style, Ricky, I don't know that my style has necessarily changed. Um, but you know, I, I've been fortunate in that, you know, I've, again, I have great people around me. So even though there were were a smaller company, you know, my team, I have, you know, really great talented people, some of them whom were there, some of them who've, you know, come since I've been there. Um, and you know, I, I, um, I, I try to do the best that I can for, for them. You know, when I, when I, when I turn up to, when I turn up to work and listen, I'm sure some days I do a better job than others, but you, you know, I, I try to do the best that I can for them to give them the space and the opportunity to, to, to do their best work. And really that, that, that's been my mindset. And that's what I say to people, you know, they say to me, what, what's your role? And I say my role is to uh, to enable the, the the team of people that I work with to give them the chance to do their best work each day. And sometimes mm. that means clearing some stuff out of the way. Sometimes mm. that means finding a way to give them the space or the resources to get on and do uh, to get on and do what they need to do. But um, I, I, I'd say that that's that's how I've tried to approach it. Michael, thank you for sharing your story with us on leading to here. Before we wrap up, we've got three quick fire questions for you. So this is just whatever comes to mind. Are you ready? All right. Okay. <laughs> Question one. Looking back over your career, what's the one thing that you're most proud of? I think continue to push myself, Rich, to, to learn, to develop, to take on new things, to take some risks. I don't know if that's one thing, but I, I'd say th- this th- this idea of just growth and and wanting to, to keep growing and keep learning. One thing you do differently, if you could go back. Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't think I'd do anything different at a macro level. You know, I feel that, um, you know, the, the decisions that I've made have led me to here, but I can certainly think of specific conversations or specific points where, you know, I, 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 I would have, I'd go back and handle that specific thing differently. Um, yeah, I'd go back and apply some learning that I took subsequently to that particular situation, you know, with, uh, with teams or with, with individuals. So 
I I think I would apply apply learning to you know prior difficult situations. Okay, and finally, one thing that gives you energy to keep going on your journey. Just constant growth, <laughs> constant growth. You know, just uh, yeah, wanting to continue to develop and grow and learn. You know, I think um, I think that's that that's that's really the, the core of, of 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 who I am, and so I I don't see that changing anytime soon. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Ricky. Thank you, Michael. So, Ricky, what an interesting uh, conversation with Michael. Oh, it really was. It was um, it, it was a real trip down memory lane, understanding Michael's kind of early beginnings and and where he's where he is now. It was just such a fascinating journey. Yeah, it, you know what I found really interesting was that he it wasn't just like a straight line path, was it? You know, he, he ran into roadblocks, he ran into problems, he jumped around a bit, he changed his mind a bit. From, you know, because he wanted to be a policeman and <laughs> they did, clearly that's not where he ended up. Well, right into the Home Secretary probably was um, an interesting um, career <laughs> choice. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But um, but no, for me, it was what, what really stood out was this importance to Michael in particular. And I think it, it resonates with certainly me and, and it will for others, certainly our listeners, around the importance of a good boss. Yeah. The influence they can have on your formative years as a leader, um, you know, they created this safety. He talked about his early career with Caroline and how she kind of went, I've got your back. Just go yeah. for it. Um, yeah. and, and that gave him the freedom to go and try and test out his skills and and almost, you know, develop them over time as opposed to expecting to be perfect on day one. Yeah, you can see that stuck with him through his career, and I, and I thought he, he clearly, from an early age, had this uh, desire to to lead things, lead people, whether it be a campaign or a cause or whatever. And perhaps he wasn't even necessarily aware of that at the time. But I also found it interesting when he said that he likes being the one that's on the hook for something. Yeah, he did, didn't he? He talked about this. Um, you know, he likes this accountability piece. Yeah. You know, it, it's on me. Um, I want to step forward and own this. And, and you know, in organisations today, that's invaluable because, you know, when things are tough, quite a lot of people go hiding, don't they? Yeah, well, I mean, you, you'll find a lot more people that want to avoid accountability rather than people that want to take accountability in organisations. So I did I did think that was, was really interesting. But, you um, know, what, do you know what leads on to that, though? Is this... Um, you know, he never gave the impression that he feels like he's the finished product. He's mm. always looking to learn. He's always striving to be better. And it was clear he's got this growth mindset that says, "Don't matter what comes at me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pivot, or I'm going to learn, or I'm going to evolve, or I'm going to develop, but I'm not going to let it take me off track." Yeah, and he, he not only from a learning point of view, but also kind of opening himself up for new experiences you know he jumped around he he was up up north and then he went down to Leeds to uni and then he went down to London and then he took on international roles you know and today he finds himself living and working um in California so he's a growth mindset around what new experiences can I have and, and can I learn from absolutely Remember to join us next time when we'll be talking to another inspirational leader that we've met and worked with over the last seven years at Thinking Focus. If you like what we're doing here with these podcasts, then why not listen to our other podcast series? The other podcast that we do is The Question Is, um, and this is where we explore everyday issues and challenges that are faced by leaders and managers today. And what we're trying to do here is we're trying to simplify complex theories and ideas to offer you practical tools, techniques, and mental models to help you to be more successful. So if you like the sound of that, you can find us on any good podcast provider. And of course, remember to subscribe to both. Thanks very much for being with us, and we'll see you next time. See you next time, everybody. Leading to here. For more episodes, visit us at thinkingfocus.com forward slash leading to here.